I will take you. You went to me. He did that to me too. I wasn't going to do that. I mean, you were in part of them. Everybody ready? We ready, Alicia? We ready. Thanks she put the door. Yep. Don't let anybody see him. Hey, you said you was missing me earlier. You said you were missing me earlier. <laughs> you know what you did? He nut up. Let's move on. Five seconds. We're going to. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the September the 5th, 2017 meeting of Mayor and Council. I'll call this meeting to order. We'll have our invocation by Councilman Danny Carter, followed by our Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. May our heads. The most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight asking for your help. You help for those people in Texas, Louisiana, and the Gulf Coast that are trying their best to recover from the hurricane. Help them as best you can and you can. We ask your help tonight at this meeting. Lead God and direct us to make decisions for the city of Villarica and all its citizens. These things we ask in the Son's name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have two uh, ceremonial presentations tonight, and uh, the first one, and I don't see him or his family, but uh, the first one is for Jamie Sailors. Uh, Jamie works in our public works department and has for 15 years, and uh, I have worked personally alongside Jamie for, for many, many years, and, and uh, he has been an asset to this city. Uh, a lot of you know, don't know this, but when... Uh-oh. A lot of you don't... Oh. <laughs> That was neat. How did you do that? Um, when, when we had major events, major snow events, ice events, Jamie was one of the ones that always answered the bell and was out there working sometimes 22 hours a day on, on getting our roads and streets and uh, everything back in shape. So, so he is one of many folks in our public works department who I am very proud of. And I uh, just want to congratulate him if he's watching or his lovely wife who also teaches with my lovely wife at uh, Providence Elementary School in Temple. Uh, we appreciate all that you do, Jamie. And our second presentation is by our uh, Safety and Risk Management Leadership. It's a Safety and Risk Management Leadership Award presented by our local government risk management service. Uh, and if I'm going to turn the podium over to him, let him present that award. So thank you all for allowing me to be here. I'm with, uh, I'm Dan Beck. I'm the director of LGRMS. I represent GMA, Georgia Municipal Association, and their insurance program. So they sell workers' compensation, property and liability, and health insurance. And uh, again, you guys are, do great business with us, and we're uh, thank you for being a partner there. We really are trying to reduce risks within our cities. Uh, as you know, insurance premiums are growing up, and the only way we're going to be able to reduce those on a long-term basis is through reducing risks within our cities. So one of the ways we're attempting to do that is recognizing people that do an outstanding job of safety leadership within an organization. And the person we'd like to recognize tonight is with from the city of Villarreca. His name is Kevin Carroll. And it says, this is what the award says, and hopefully I won't need my glasses. Uh, we believe having a strong risk control culture uh, is the only way uh, to sustain long-term risk reduction. Uh, we are also believers that strong risk control leaders are responsible for building 
that culture. You are awarded the, and, uh, this is a, you are a model of excellence in safety and risk management leadership. So this goes to Kevin Carroll, who is a, a member of the police department, but also acts as the city's safety officer, safety coordinator within our pools, both workers' compensation, property and liability insurance, our biggest risk profile in, occurs within our law enforcement group. And that's where we need our biggest, uh, that's really where we need our biggest efforts. So we would really like to say thank you to Kevin, thank you to City of, uh, of Villa Rica for your commitment and leadership to providing a strong risk reduction culture. So thank you so much. We will make sure. Now, we'll make sure Officer Carroll gets that, and thank you for being with us tonight. So and uh, for the partnership that we have with GMA, many of us take care uh, part in those uh, safety training classes throughout the year, and, and uh, we appreciate your involvement. I'm going to allow you to give that to him if you can, Mayor. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have the uh, agenda before you, and hopefully you've had a time to look at it. Do I? Are there any changes in the agenda as written and presented? Yeah, I'm going to. Any, anybody have anything before I? <coughs> okay, I've got a couple of things I want to, changes I want to make in the agenda. Uh, first of all, I have been asked to remove item C1. is the insurance um, information that we've been working on and the very thick packet that's in our, our agendas. And uh, I have been told that our city attorney wants to look at that a little bit more in depth. So we're, I would ask that we remove from the agenda. Also ask that items E5 and E6 be removed from the agenda. And uh, Mr. D.R. Horton has requested that we defer until the October meeting on those two agenda items. And I would like to add, uh, just for the purposes of discussion, a, uh, just a briefing on our impending hurricane that's out in the uh, ocean right now and headed evidently toward Florida and just, just uh, get a little assurance and just make sure we're ready for that. So we'll just, I'll just cover that under council information. Okay, do I hear a motion that we approve the agenda as amended? So I have a motion and a second. All in favor? It is unanimous. Council updates. I have one and I meant to bring uh, it with me, but it's pretty much in my head and it's this. Um, I was just going to share with you real quick something I picked up over at the convention and it's something that's called a practicum and it's a way, it's a way that cities can get some expertise help and not spend any money. And the way they do this is there's certain universities that are a part of this cooperative with GMA, the Georgia Municipal Association. And these universities that are in this group, we don't have West Georgia at this point, but West Georgia does help us with interns. And if you need research done, and most of it's done off campus, so it's not even like they need to be here, I mean off campus, but I mean not in our facilities. A lot of times they can work remotely and uh, they can help us research and do things that we would normally have to pay somebody to do or maybe our staff doesn't have the time to do and just wanted to mention that that's something that is available to cities. I hope we'll be able to avail ourselves of it. I have some more information on it at home um, to go over with any city staff but just thought that was kind of cool and thought I'd share that that there are ways we can get help from the universities using students that are overseen by professors that work in this area and uh, get some help. So, Thank you, ma'am. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, add that uh, Janet Hyde, this will be her last official meeting with us again. 
and uh, Janet, we appreciate you coming back and, and spending a little time with us. Uh, Janet has accepted a position with Carroll County, and it's more in her wheelhouse of what she's her, her uh, background is. So, Janet, thank you for all that you've done for the city this time and the last time, and uh, we wish nothing but the best for you. And I want to, I guess I'll add that, this, I'll just want to, some of this is directed at our city manager, but uh, it appears that we are uh, facing a fairly severe uh, hurricane at some point next week, early next week, and, and I just want to make sure that uh, we're ready for that, ready in the sense that, where's Charlie at? Charlie's like, yeah, I know he's going to call me on me. Plenty of chainsaws. You know, make sure all the vehicles are full of fuel and, because that could be a commodity and and uh, just make sure we're ready for that. You always have, but, uh, you know, this is, you know, I don't want to be planning on, on Friday when everybody else is trying to gather up chainsaws and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we'll prepare for the worst and pray for the best. So anything else? Okay. Moving along, city manager's report. Mayor and Council, we've had a very interesting, um, I guess, six days now since we met for the Council retreat. And a couple of things I'd like to, to bring to your attention that have, have occurred during that time. Uh, you know that we are in communication with Raftelis, who is doing the water and sewer rate study. Um, so that's moving along. We have um, the water pressure study that is being conducted under Pete's direction that's already beginning to pinpoint some er areas that need attention. So that's uh, progressing. One thing that is um, not per perking along like I'd like it to is the budget. So while all these other things are going on that we're working on, that one is quietly yelling at us because that's going to take a lot of time. But the, the time that we spent those two Fridays were helpful in, in terms of giving us direction about, about where to go in 18. Um, the nine-month year will make some differences in how we do that. So if you approve that tonight, that will be a consideration as we go forward. Another issue that has um, been on my mind that I've not s spent much time on until today is the condition of our network and file servers. I asked the Blue Group last week for some statistics on the status of our file servers and it was very bleak so that is another item that is crucial and screaming silently that could result in significant loss of data that would put us in jeopardy in various ways depending on which server uh, becomes an issue so we'll be bringing something back for that soon. I've got um, one company <coughs> taking a look at some off-site storage that would give us a little bit of comfort. But we've got some hardware issues there that we need to address. Health insurance is another significant issue and disappointment, but we met today um, you saw the email that we recommended that we pull it tonight. The issue that we have is that there is a window of opportunity for us to make this change. And that window is the time in which we were able to present a claims history that produced a stop loss premium that was about the same as a fully insured insurance proposal. So I'm going to say that again. When, when we went back and pulled history, it was pretty good. And we gave that to the stop loss provider. 
he quoted us a price, and that price was about what we would have paid United Healthcare anyway. That window is fixing to close because in the subsequent month after that claims history, we've had a really bad claim. So if we have to go back and reprice that, then, then th those numbers are not going to have that relationship anymore and it will be more expensive to go do what we proposed. So because of that, we've asked David to have his issues with the contracts resolved or for him to make a final decision that we can't resolve them by the 22nd council retreat because we plan on that day to again have a special call meeting because there's a couple of de development things that we need you to vote on that are time sensitive for closings so we'd like to bring that on the 22nd and if you approve that we can still do an October 1 implementation if we don't then I think it's out the window and we're back to UHC full time so that's not a reflection on David at all because these contracts are complicated. I mean, if you even glanced at them, you saw what was involved. So, that, so those are the kinds of things we're working on now. There's, there's a lot of moving pieces to a lot of that. We've got Janet leaving. We've got a potential engineering position that's on the agenda for tonight that will affect how we post and, and handle that. And then we've got to deal with the interim situation. So that's coming up. So when you're coming in, you know, asking about what's going on, those things are going on. Plus we've got a couple of, you know, failed neighborhood roads, street light situations that we're dealing with. We've got another LMIG list that we're putting together for road improvements. A lot, there's, a, there's a lot on the table right now. And poor Pete, he's trying to put together the GIFA list and I, I think that was a bad decision on my part to ask him to do that because I, that just about pushed him over the edge, I think, <laughs> when he actually wrote it all down at one time. Because we, we just can't, it's, it's, over, it's truly overwhelming that what we have to do there. Where are we at on our roads issue? Which? The, uh, you know, the problem we had with our roads last year with our contractor we had the geotech done on the 24th and i think our we're meeting on the 11th which is monday so we're hoping to have the results back from everything next monday um an, an, there's another issue that we're trying to wrap our head around that goes back at least a decade but i was looking at the minutes from 2004 when we were doing some of the subdivision work out on the east side that relates to some of the issues that we're having now with developments that have you know not made it and are trying to come back and Pete help me if, if I get these numbers wrong but it sounds like what happened back in the day was we looked at the north plant and we said, this is this can't go forward. You know, we're at, we have a half million capacity. It needs to be a million or a million one. We need to we need to either look at you know no more permitting or something. And we made some changes. We built the West Plant. We made some changes to the Cleghorn lift station. I think we pulled several hundred thousand gallons off of the North Plant. What we so we probably extended the, the life of the north plant maybe 10 years well those 10 years are up or whatever that time period was is about up the north plant's getting close to being full again so we've been talking about it it looks like 80 houses is what we could comfortably add out there before we start having issues with the north plant again so that issue so the the project that we discussed of connecting the two plants is also silently screaming at us. You know, nobody knows, but, you know, I could make another comment about stuff hitting the fan. That one's fixing to hit the fan, okay? 
And when it does, we're going to have a moratorium on development. And that's where all the development's going to be is on the side where there's the moratorium because we're not really building residential on the west side. So we're also working on that. So, what do you do after lunch? That's a g <laughs> yeah. So that so those are the those are the issues that that we've identified, and what they all have in common is they they all have age to them, and and none of them are visible. You know, they're not they're not the kind of thing that you can see. It's not a tree that's falling in the road or. A pothole, you know, it's either pipes in the ground that are the wrong size, or lift stations that aren't big enough, or plants that are, you know, the capacity in the wrong place, or whatever. And so, and so we're working on it, but and I, I told them about this, and I've spoken to, to most of y'all. I said this privately, but um, I've gone from being very sad to very upset to, you know, somewhat. You know, built up a little bit because I, I feel like we've at, late, at least got a handle on where we need to go now, and uh, we didn't have a roadmap, you know, to speak of in the past. So, so I think uh, I commend you and staff for, for pulling all that together, uh, so that we do at least know where we are, and it's not in a good place, but at least we have some sort of idea of what it's going to take to get us there. I still remember that uh, when this council voted to build the west plant i thought it was for connectivity of the north plant and that evidently never happened so, so i asked tom today uh to look at you know what the cost is of, of uh, connecting those two plants because because it's not a matter of if it's just a matter of when we're going to have to make that happen so uh, i think that's a one of many critical issues that we've got to look at but perhaps one of the top ones so Thank you, sir. Any questions of our city manager? Yeah, a question. Uh, what was the reason behind us not getting the seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar funds that we lost out When I talked to well, when I heard from them on Thursday they didn't know yet. So, you heard from the engineer? Just to clarify on that, that's where we had the possibility of getting a $750,000 grant to help us replace some of the water pipes. Um, quite a few of them are in Ward 3, which is a lot of the older section. That was that was so disappointing to get that email well, that we didn't get it. But it also leaves Pooh Road uh, without fire protection, so uh, CDBG, I don't know what that stands for, but I would like to know. Yeah, we'll, we'll bring whatever information we get from them. Okay. And I've got one more thing I want to bring up, and this is just uh, for, for the audience and those watching us at home, but also for the council. Uh, I've spoken to a couple of you, and I talked to Tom about it today. Uh, we have asked an awful lot of our residents this year uh, that senior tax exemption hurt our seniors, uh, and then uh, with the impending rate raise in our water rates, it's going to hit our everybody that lives in the city and uh, I think that we need to uh, show good faith and, and, a, and an effort to do the same with the city budget so I have asked Tom to, to look at the idea of, of uh, creating a, a, f a special fund where we can put money aside like I do on a rainy day uh, Michael's laughing because he, had, he smiled because that was an idea that he had had a while back but but you know in, in my home when the uh, when we have something big we have to replace we start saving money up because we know it's about to go out well I think we're past the point of that right now but I think it's a, a good this is a good time for us to, to do that and to tighten our belts and and uh, show our, our residents that, that we're going to come to the table and we're going we're gonna to do better too and uh, we're, we're going to commit money that we didn't spend if, if we have money left over in capital projects for example uh, and or if there's a percentage I know Jay used to have the mayor's challenge I think was two percent uh, of each operating budget was cut back so uh, at least you know again we'll have a source of funds we can put money in that and we're also showing that we're a good steward of, of taxpayers money and trying to save as well so just wanted to make that that comment any other comments okay we will move on to the consent agenda. All right, public comment section. 
Oh, I'm sorry. What do I always forget? Every month I forget that. Okay. We need a bolt or something. We have reached the public comment section of our meeting. Uh, anyone wishing to, to give public comments, please come forward, state your name and address for the record, and please limit your uh, remarks to three minutes. Good evening. Michael Young, 9634 Coastal Point Drive. In the work session, there was a question asked that didn't get a public answer. How much of how much money should be in the general reserve? The attempted answer we was focused on water and sewer, but that what really wasn't what the question was about. The question is about the overall general reserve for the city, which is $5 million right now. A few years ago, it was 10. So it's half of what it was a few years ago. So how much should we have in there? This question is pertinent because you're looking at a $3 million loan, GFA loan, to fix stuff that we kicked the can down the road on for year after year after year. Last year, we didn't put one single dime into a contingency fund for things that we knew we were going to have a problem. We knew the water sewer was a problem. We knew we would have unexpected expenses. We didn't put a single dime into contingency fund in the budget. Now, you may be able to scrape together money that left over from this or that, but there wasn't anything budgeted for unexpected expenses or for these things that we kicked down the road, kicked the can down the road on. <coughs> and now we've got problems. I would certainly expect in the upcoming budget that even though we had a mill rollback, I would certainly expect that that budget is going to reap significant extra money over last year's budget and that we would contribute a lot of that extra money to a contingency fund to address these problems that we've got right now. Thanks, sir. Thank you for allowing me to even come. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, I'm from the Old Town Village, and I happened to see it on your agenda tonight that it was there. and. Uh, but I just want to bring a few remarks concerning the uh, area in which is eroding. And uh, I think one of the biggest things I'm concerned with right now is the lighting. Uh, we are, a lot of us in there are, I'm a senior, so I have a fixed income, and it's hard to maintain what you're trying to do and, and to keep up. I'm not new to Villarica. I've been here for 18 years but I've only been there one month. And I bought a home there and the lights went out. And where I live, which uh, our council lady, Street Louis Tree, uh, Leslie, came out and uh, looked at the property and, and Tom as well. I met them both there. Uh, our area, at least where I live, and I do represent a few others, but where I live, it is totally black. There is no lighting in that area if we don't have it on. So I made the efforts to go in and start turning on the lights with different people. We've got a total of four lights on, but that's not new the 13 that are there. And it's very dark and it's set out to where uh, it is, it can be scary. Uh, I'm not standing there in fear. Uh, I'm a minister, I love the Lord, I trust him. but. There are others there that I'm concerned about. Uh, children that are, that are playing there, I'm concerned about. And uh, I'm asking the council today uh, if they would consider burdening that bill, picking that bill up, and taking it until uh, uh, either it's me or another, that we can begin to try to come together and form some sort of something. Like I said, I'm new. Nothing's been formed. Roads have been eroding. People have been left. Uh, so that's my, that's my heart, that's their heart, some of the ones I've talked to. So if we need to try to get an HOA together or an adoption of the roads. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Mr. Barber said that we were, we were barely, but we are, in the city limits. So we're pleading with you that we can get the lights on. There are those there that obviously cannot turn them on. They're not on. Uh, we've only got a few on. So that's our bird. That's our where we're coming from. And I don't know how late you all say. I know you're going to bring it up. And I've got a ministerial meeting at 730. So I don't know if I'll be there 
be here for the whole time. So by 7, I'm going to be probably leaving. But I hope I can get in on some of that. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you, sir. Mr. Walters, it'll also be, there'll be video. So if you do miss it, you can go to the video archive and watch that part of the meeting. All right. Thank if you. that works for you. Okay. Thank you. I'm Deborah Shadricks, and I also live in Old Town Village. <laughs> um, same concerns that Mr. Walters has. We came in one night. It was dark. They came and just turned everything off. There was no notice. No one told us a thing. And I mean, it is black. You can't see the hand in front of your face. We do have children. I walked my dog down the street. I felt fairly decent walking at least part of the way down the street with the dog, but now I don't even feel comfortable with that. Um, we did call, David and I called, and we've turned our lights on. I've also gave, gave one, uh, another neighbor two doors down from me the phone number of a gentleman to call to turn his light on because he doesn't feel safe either. And I have spoke, I've been living in that subdivision for 10 years. I bought into that thinking that we would have, it is supposed to be in a private community with a gate that worked for privacy. That's the reason I bought in there. I was single at the time. I'm married now, but that doesn't necessarily keep out anything, but I don't feel quite as alone anyway. Um, and the gate has never worked. That's why we all bought into that community to begin with. There are several of us who were original owners, and the community is great. The people are nice there. Everybody in the community we don't all know each other personally, but we see each other on the street and we wave or whatever. And I don't know, Mr. Walters, you must live in the townhouse section in the back. The in the He's back. in the that back. That is the pit the back there. I feel are. sorry. <laughs> for, I really feel sorry for you guys back there. I truly do, because I'm in the beginning of the subdivision, so at least I might feel a little safer. But I'm going to tell you, it's a safety issue that those lights are not on. Mine is on because I'm paying $15 a month to have it on. Do I want to do that? No, because we haven't ever paid for them. <laughs> I feel like my mom lives in a subdivision in Carrollton. They don't pay for their lighting, but they're not a private community. And I realize that's why the roads were never finished. There's potholes in the road down the street. They're just horrible. Um, there's coyotes down there. I've gotten to where I don't even want to take the dog down that far. I'm afraid one's going to get at, get after one or both of us. And I don't own a very big dog. Um, so my thing is, we are concerned for the safety of the community because we are a good band of citizens <coughs> in the community. So I would really like for you guys to consider that as well. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, J John Mount, 214 Rockmart Road. And I'd like to speak about the Enterprise Fund. I know you uh, discussed earlier you have the um, rate study coming up, but I definitely want to see the city pay for the water out of those Enterprise Funds. It should not come out of the General Fund. Um, <coughs> Jody and I would like to eat out every night. We can't afford it, but we don't ask our neighbors to help pay for that. We also don't want to pay for other people's water, the factories around here, all this stuff. So I hope that when the council sees fit to do this, I know it's a hardship on some people to raise the water rates, um, but you need to pay for the water you use, and hopefully you can figure out how to do that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Jody Mount, 214 Rockmart Road. And uh, my blood pressure rocketed when I heard you, Mayor Reese, say former Mayor Collins had a mayor challenge trim 2% from every budget. One of the reasons we're in the situation we're in now was because of that philosophy of do more with less. Why is this subdivision in the shape it's in? Where was the city when that was being built? Did we trim that budget? Were we expecting that? community development or whatever inspectors whatever you know and that's just that's just a very in-your-face situation right now the whole enterprise thing that everything that Tom talked about goes back goes back so those of you that have been on this council since then I'm, I'm hope you're taking notes I hope you're seeing the folly of that 
and it's you know yeah seniors having a hard time but you know what there are some young families that are having a hard time too so I, I, I just please I get really upset when we want to make blanket exceptions you reach a certain age so all of a sudden you get a free ride no if you need help where are the churches where are the churches you know it's we've got to be responsible and that means we've got to spend money and we've got to do it right we've got to do it right thank you thank you ma'am anybody else seeing now we'll close the public comment section of the meeting and uh, we'll go to our consent agenda and uh, for those of you that are new uh, or those of you that may have forgotten the consent agenda is a single item that encompasses all things the city council would normally approve with a little comment each of these items were discussed at the Thursday, June the 1st, 2017. That's not a correct date. Nope. At the Thursday uh, work oh, session. The first, yeah. And uh, it was a unanimous consensus of the governing body to place the following items on the consent agenda. And those items are uh, work authorization for integrated science and engineering. And number two, bail bond agency application. Number three, court condemned property number four uh, memorandum of understanding addressing bank at highway and number five uh, gold dust park master plan uh, design i don't believe that's master plan design i think that's for the tennis courts okay do i hear a motion that we approve the consent agenda as read and written a motion and a second all in favor it is unanimous Okay, tab A, governing body. Ladies and gentlemen, you have before you the minutes of the August, I mean the July 27th, August 1st, August 18th, and August 25th meetings. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at those. Any changes in those minutes as presented? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve. So move. Okay. Have a motion and a second, all in favor? Unanimous. Item A2, Carroll County Inmate Work Detail Agreement, and this would be our city manager. As we discussed in work session, we inadvertently failed to approve both of the inmate agreements with Carroll County Sheriff. During the recent meeting with the uh, representative from the Sheriff's Office, um, that was brought to my attention. He provided the agreement. This is the document that includes um, the city provision of the van, I believe. Uh, as we mentioned Thursday night, they want to make the two agreements identical at the next renewal, so this would be the last six-month period where we provide it <coughs> on one and not on the other. Uh, one of the concerns that was expressed during work session involved the use of the van outside of the parameters of the agreement, so I talked to Major Jordan about that. He informed me that their policy was to not use the van outside of transporting inmates back and forth to the city for their work detail, but that there is another Villa Rica van over there that is used by them for the housing authority. And that was the crew that was doing the Bowden work. The guard that does that um, detail is a Bowden resident and evidently has a contract or something. I don't know how that works exactly, but we'll let the sheriff and Bowden work that one out. So my recommendation is that we approve this, and then between now and the end of the, or maybe the December meeting when this comes back around, we'll have the conversation about expanding again, either from two to three crews or from six inmates to eight or seven or something per crew something so that we can um, get public work some additional help there discussion of council 
just that that's not our van, right? The the housing authority van, no, is not. Okay. So we have no connection to that. All right. That's all I but need. But it says City of Little Rick on it, so that's where <laughs> we're told that. No, it's not is, put there. That was a. Is there a liability part. issue? We're told. Because like, we think it's one of our vans. Can we make sure that that thing is not tied to us, that it belongs to the housing authority? That, that's not one of our vans, is it, Charlie? Okay. Okay. I move to approve the amendment agreement. Second. I have a move and a second. Discussion? If not, all in favor? Unanimous. Okay, item three, sale of city-owned property in Georgia Department of Transportation, GDOT, for right-of-way for the North Loop. This is a recommendation from staff that we sell a small parcel along the, the North Loop for $49,000 to GDOT for right-of-way. Tom, you give us a little background on that? Or, or All right. All right. Uh, we purchased 75 acres uh, ahead of the construction of the road. Um, we paid about $6,500 an acre. About 15% of it's in the floodplain. When GDOT uh, uh, appraised it, they uh, came back and offered us 38000 which is about six, a little less than 6400 so a little bit less per acre than what we paid for it. We had it appraised and it came back significantly higher and we made a counter offer which they rejected. So when we met with them and took a look at the, at the use of the land without the road and the relatively short period of time that we've owned it, uh, the GDOT rep and I agreed that, that 49000 would put us up over 8000 an acre which we felt like was reasonable given the landlocked nature of the the property and the fact that apart from the road construction the land really hadn't seen any change in value so i'm co i'm comfortable with this the um the the deal also includes some uh some uh, permanent easement which was a almost three acres as well so this this right of way is for the building of the North Loop bypass. Right, the North Loop is going to bisect the 75 acres. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't here from that, so I can't speak to what everybody was thinking at the time. But and also on the landmarks, a lot of the property. I mean, once you yeah. Have well, I mean, the yeah. The no best problem. thing is it may it it significantly improves both sides of the bisected property. Correct. So we make a motion uh, that we accept the GDOT for it, give them, sell them the acreage for fourteen thousand dollars for the right of way. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. I uh, want to make sure, Council, have you have you had a chance to look at this agreement and you're comfortable with it? Yes, yes, we looked at it and it looked uh, fine. Okay. Have a motion and a second. Further discussion? No, all in favor? Unanimous. It leaves about 69 and a half acres left that the city still owns. Yeah. Split. Split. <coughs> the bypass going to part of it, so <coughs> usable land. Okay. Item number four engineer position to community development. <coughs> And uh, our city manager is gonna gonna speak to this, but but uh, I, I think that uh, that I want to also just kind of weigh in on this. Um, as we've all talked in the last two weeks, we can see the the dire need of an engineer uh, in the past. You know, decisions that were made, and uh, you know, I, I I think this is a good decision on on the city's part if if we can do it. So, uh, with that, lead, sir. So as, as we've discussed earlier, Janet's departure is going to create a vacancy in community development. What I'm recommending, and the reason that we're bringing this now instead of in the budget, is I would like for us to create this engineer position and make it the community development director, and then retitle 
and retask a little bit the position that Janet's been in to a planning and zoning coordinator position and have it report to the engineer, have both the permit clerk and the assistant and code enforcement all report to the engineer. And if we don't do it now, then it, it puts me in a quandary immediately because I would either have to assume you're going to do it in the budget change Janet's job description and hire the planning and zoning coordinator which would be a non-supervisory position except that we would be temporarily making it supervisory and then change it in January or assume that we're not going to do it replace J Janet with someone in the same job and then demote them in January which None of that makes sense to me. So I, this is my preferred way of doing it, even though it's not ideal because we're not tying it into the first of the year with the budget. Tom, for the sake of the audience, could you clarify some of the advantages, just briefly? In other words, you know how we're paying for this in a sense already, and how it protects the city to have our own engineer. What, right now, we have a the city has a contract with MetroCorp, which is primarily Herbert Humphreys. And Herbert is providing us with plan review services amongst other things. He's worked with Charlie on the LMIG project list. He's worked with Pete on water and sewer capacity. We're, we're paying for the services now. It's just we're doing it on a much greater hourly rate. And it's not as convenient when, when uh, when Janet and I wanted to meet with her staff and Herbert, you know, we had to we had to go through the rigmarole of well, when's he going to be here and when's he available, and, and you know, if it's a staff position, then somebody's here all the time. But plan review is crucial for us, and one of the things, and just so you know, I, I use MetroCorp in my previous job, and so we did a four million dollar road improvement there for the South Fulton CID. The, our, our city was the, the agent that did that. So we designed this, we designed the RFP and bid it and awarded it and inspected it and paid it and you know just got reimbursed for everything. And, and Herbert's organization provided a full-time inspector for maybe eight months, which was insanely expensive. But we got a first class industrial road out of it so this is sort of a you get what you pay for kind of situation we're already you know working through one where we didn't have full-time inspection and and are you know not happy with the result to have somebody in here that can provide that kind of assistance um, going forward would would make having a staff person even stronger so if we have a full-time person that can do plan review and then we still have Herbert in the wings which is what I would recommend then when we get into these projects we can we can have some, him or somebody out on the street actually watching the construction because what we've learned is if you're not inspecting it you're not going to get what you expect. What you're going to get is what's in the best interest of the contractor, which is going to be, from time to time, unacceptable. Ladies and gentlemen, I would entertain a motion. I move to approve the new position as part of the proposal the city manager. Second. I have a motion and multiple seconds. Further discussion? If not, all in favor? Unanimous. Okay, tab B, finance, Ms. Sarah. Good evening. Hi, Sarah. Okay, again, we have the July financial update for you. Um, starting at the top, general fund, which is your administration, police department, recreation, public works. Um, you can see here, total cash as of the end of July was almost four and a half million dollars. And um, total unassigned fund balance is $5.2 million. Um, 
I did pull up the um, our 28 or 2017 budget book does have a, a copy of the city's fund balance policy if you want to refer to that but our city requires 40 percent of fund balance in the general fund um, which calculates to about 4.8 million so we are over that in the general fund but um, that's more of a stability fund so again um, while we're happy to see that we have at least 40 percent in there um, we don't necessarily you know there isn't much much over that 4.8 million for other um, future projects or um, emergencies next is major revenue statuses um, in this fund it's mostly taxes first one being your sales tax we have received 47 percent of the budget there sales tax runs a month in arrears so um, the sales tax that we get in January we will we will back into this year property tax um, it's just a small amount so far this year 150,000 we um, now that the millage has been accepted um, I heard from both counties and the states accepted their digest so we are on our way to collecting our property tax for this year occupational tax we are sitting at 92 percent of the budget uh, with $367,000 received and permits and inspections um, we've seen we've, we have received triple the budget so far this year at $295,000 it's great um, next is fund status just overall our revenue is trending at 5% higher than last year and our expense um, is 11% higher than last year but if you look at the previous column there you can see we've only spent 52% of our general fund budget and after seven months you would estimate about 58% so we're a little bit less than that going on to water and sewer uh, cash here is a negative $85,000 at the end of um, July which is actually better than the previous month um, this again does not mean we have negative cash in the bank it means that this fund owes cash to the other funds we do have a CD in that fund for just over two million two million dollars we have a bond of 33 million dollars and our equity in that fund is 2.2 million dollars um, that was the one I was referring to the other day which should be at 25 percent which calculates to 1.7 almost 1.8 million dollars so you can see we're just above that as well so that's um, again that's just kind of our safety net we have to our policy requires us to be at that um, but we don't have much above that for emergencies capital those sort of things uh, major revenues there water and sewer sales um, we're at 0.4 higher than last year which um, so we're, we're steady compared to last year and tap fees um, kind of they are higher like our permits and inspections um, we've received 363,000 so far this year in that overall our revenue is trending 7% higher than this time last year and our expenditures are at 33 higher 33 percent higher than last year um, I think part of that water purchases are over budget um, I think so overall we've, we've spent 60 percent when you compare it to the 58 percent of where we would want to see after seven months um, next solid waste we have a negative cash in this fund of three hundred thirty seven thousand dollars again this just means this fund owes cash to the other funds unfortunately we have a negative equity um, in this fund this falls under the umbrella of the 25 percent so we are required to have a 25 percent um, which would be close to 200 almost two hundred fifty thousand dollars of equity and we have almost negative that amount um, we hope to address that with the upcoming rate study next solid waste revenue um, is down one percent compared to this time last year um, in both that line item and just overall our expense is trending higher than last year um, as we've spoken about in the past um, our, our major line item in this budget is our payment to waste industries for the, the, the carts that they the garbage and the recycle that they collect for us um, and their uh, agreement allows for them to increase by CPIU every year and looks like in this this summer it, it increased 3.6 percent so um, that's part of the reason we're um, above where we where we want to see any questions on that this is on the website I put this out of the, on the website every month as well as the check register so folks can kind of see what we, we are spending money on and this is this is another case of uh, kicking the can down the road or not not uh, so the company that we do business with waste management industries has it in the contract with us to go up on the rates every year based on the consumer price index yes. we don't have that policy Correct. so every year they've gone up we have not gone up Any questions of staff? Item two. This is a request to change our fiscal year end. 
In 2013, the city changed from a May 31st year in to a December 31st year in. I'm requesting that we change from the December 31st year in to a September 30 year in. This will allow um, our budgeting process to line up more with the property tax. Um, and it's not just property tax. The majority of our taxes are received in that fourth quarter or even into the next year. And we have to, um, we, you know, uh, governmental accounting allows me to put it back in that prior year. But as far as budgeting and forecasting, it makes um, the timing a little bit diff difficult. Any questions on that? So basically what this allows us to do is, is not go blind into our budget. We'll have all, most of the numbers in place so that when we do a budget, we won't have to interpolate or, or try to guess what's, what's coming down the road six months from now. Yes, this will allow us to set our budget at the same time we're setting our millage rate. So we will not be guessing at those numbers. We'll be um, using the actual numbers that we got from the counties. I don't think we've said it directly, but what Sarah's about to do is predict property taxes twice. Does that make sense? No, no. We're going to predict this November and December receipts and next year at the same time. That's the issue. Right. Because we're going to go on a nine-month budget, basically. Yeah, if we go to a nine-month, then we would be putting the budget together in the fall, late summer and fall. We'd have one property tax to predict, but the year that we were in, we would have collected all of it in the first and second quarter of the year so it would be known but after that we should and then we'll every year you would only be estimating one of them right so basically what we're doing is changing from the what we have done in the past and those people chose to predict one thing now you're choosing to predict the other Instead of predicting two things, like Tom said, I'll only have to predict one. And, and when she predicts it, she'll have the digest. Yeah. Well, they, because they the predict, digest comes out at the yeah, end of July. Yeah, it makes a difference. They predicted one before, but they chose to predict the other one other than what you're... And it's not... I'm, by no means am I saying it's wrong. All I'm saying is that we're choosing to do it a little bit different than it's been done in the past, and i right. got no problem with it. And we have a resolution to that effect. Okay. I would entertain a motion. Okay. Second. For the, for the record, let's let's make sure we clarify what the what the what the resolution says here. Change yeah. in the fiscal right. year. So so change the fiscal year from January to December to to October to September. Are you going so to read that resolution? No. I mean that unless it you know, feels like I need to read it. I mean, as long as we just state it, I just wanted it for the for the folks out there to know what we were doing. Yeah. That's Okay. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Next is a request to change from monthly billing for our, for our water, sewer, and sanitation <coughs> to cycle billing. So that would be basically a bill every week. We would divide the city into four geographic areas. We would read, we would read each of those um, areas once a month, same same situation, but it would be a time, uh, your, the, the due date would change. So right now, all the meters are read around the 15th of the month. All the bills are sent around the 30th of the month. Then they're due the following 15th of the next month, and then we don't cut off for another month and 10 days um, if for non-payment. So right now, the time between when we read the meters and when they pay is 30 days, and the time between the due date and cutoff is 40 days. So by um, shortening, by changing the cycle, so we're doing a fourth of the city every week of the month. Um, we will be spreading out our cash flow. We'll, we will receive um, revenue out throughout the month and we'll be spreading out the workflow for the staff. And it's not just customer service. Um, it's our meter readers and um, people who are helping connect and disconnect and that sort of thing. Um, but also it'll shorten the time between when we read the meters to the due date. So we'll be able to read the meter and bill <coughs> in a few days. And so then the due date will just be two weeks after that. So you're shortening the time from when they actually use the water to when they pay for it. I move to approve the new bill, please. Second. I have a motion to second that we approve the recommendation from staff. All in, do, any discussion on that? All in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Lastly, um, 
This was just to ask for discussion about a possible GFA loan, which is the Georgia Environmental Finance Authority, um, uh, estimated $3 million in order to address some of these critical projects that Pete discussed last time and Tom um, even discussed earlier. So. Um, some of those would be increasing the line size from 6 inches to 12 inches on Liberty Road, correcting the backflow issue at the 61 booster pump station, engineering for moving wastewater from the east side of town to the west, west wastewater plant, uh, utility betterment for the North Loop project, and additional pro projects for adequate fire protection. And just for, the, for clarification, this will not fix all our problems. This is just a drop in the bucket. But what this does is get us on a road to correction. And it is a stopgap measure, measure to correct some of the more critical issues that we have in the city that our city manager alluded to in his comments. And, uh, you know, no, you know we, would, we would prefer not to be in this situation, quite frankly, but we are in this situation. And I think to do anything other than move forward and try to correct the correct the critical issues would be a mistake so um this is for discussion only right so tom help i leave my only concern in this area and that has to do with a loan my understanding is that the uh the interest rate is excellent that's great but if we had this loan and i know some of this is almost life and death issues <laughs> right fire pressure of water so or if we have backups we get fined so then it cost us because we get fined because of the backup or overflow and that sort of thing so I do believe these are critical so if something happens and the whole economy drops out and we have this loan and we have you know what we need to pay on our bond are we ready for that? How will we handle that? Will this will this put us in any, any more of a situation where we have more debt out there? That it's debt. I'm just trying to figure out: can we take care of all this? Right. So what what we're gonna what we're proposing as a result of the Raftella study is that we phase the sewer increases over three years, and the reason. We rec we're recommending three years is because that's when the next bond payment increase goes into effect. So we'll go from a $1.7 million payment to almost $2 .2 million in 2020. So whatever we do, we need to do over the next three years. What that's going to mean by phasing it instead of doing it now is we're not going to have money to do these kind of projects because we're pushing the increase out over three years instead of doing it all at once. So we've got to have money to get us through capital projects, especially repairs, for the next two years. And we could borrow $10 million and not do the list but Pete and I can't run 10 million worth of projects in two years. You know, there, there's a limit because he's running water and sewer day to day and I've got the day to day stuff to do. So this, the capital on top of that is literally on top of that. And, and you see what happens when you don't manage construction. It, it doesn't turn out well. So we've got to be able to manage these things so that they have a, a, a high quality to them. Or, you know, we're spending money and kicking the can again for somebody else to come back and do it right later. <coughs> so some of these really are urgent and crucial. And, I mean, if there's anything that's going to be more frustrating to us than to be paying for the West plant and have capacity and not be able to add more houses because we can't get the flow there so I mean one of these is absolutely essential and this is just to do the engineering not the construction so when we get to that that's going to you know be a different conversation same thing with the north loop you know I'd like to see us put water and sewer on the north loop while we're doing the road that's the way you do it most cost effectively but that's more money that's, that's what 10,000 feet Two miles. That's almost a two-mile installation. 
we've already talked about fire flow. Absolutely, positively have to do that now. So I think if we just bite off a few of these, that's you know that's going to keep us going for two years pretty hard. Since this is a discussion, when are you going to actually bring the proposal to us to vote on? I'm not pushing Pete <laughs> for for that part of the list, but once he and I have agreed on what's on the list, then we've got to go back and work with people that can estimate all of this. Then we go back and do the funding. The good thing about the funding is the money is always available. There's $550 million, I think, in GFO money right now that they're in danger of giving back to the, to the federal government if they don't loan it out. So they're looking for projects. But loaning, borrowing the money is never the problem. You know, we've got to be able to pay it back. And if we, and if we do this in, in like a 10-year note and we, if we get the rate increases through over three years, then, then we'll be okay. And, and the bigger issue is being able to handle that 2020 bond increase, which is that's the real bullet, not this. So this calculation that, that has been done, I know this engineering moving the wastewater from east to west, that's the north plant to the west plant, which is crucial, but that's just the engineering. Um, my question is, has this $3 million been included in the rate study? Does Raftelis have this as part of the rate study? Well, what they have is they have what we would like to, to generate every year for water and sewer to do fixes, but by phasing the increases over three years in the first year you're not going to have that money so this is taking its place okay. so no but sort of yes in a in an indirect way it's, it's a substitute but not directly <coughs> and, and, and the three million is a complete swag I mean we just we had to put something down here we maybe ten million maybe two million I mean I don't know till we get you know till we get some hard numbers. Council? Well, we really Go for now. I guess we're sort of Until waiting we get to get a proposal. More information. Right. Yeah. I was just asking, when can we expect that? <laughs> we just answered that. I, I don't know, Pete, what do you think? In his free time? We're going to know something in a month? <laughs> You want to encapsulate for the audience and for those listening, because I don't think any of or Pete, you can come up and hit replay and hit play. Sound like you said a possible maybe <laughs> in 30 days. Yeah, that oh, was a possible maybe. That's, yes, <laughs> I, I implied that. That's what it sounded like. Implied that. Assuming that nothing else goes wrong and yes, we get the budget done and all those other things. We're working really hard to try to get that to you. Heck, we'll give you 60 days. How's that? No, we don't have. We would like to have it sooner yeah. rather than later. Yeah, water pressure study is going to be happening during that time, and Raftelis rate study, and yeah, there's there's a lot going down in the next 30 days with Pete's job. Berlin's waving a sign over here. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? All right. Item two. Is a rezoning request RA-03-17, Ms. Janet? Good evening, Mayor and Council. The first item that I have for you tonight is a rezoning RA-03-17. The applicant is Umberto Melendez of 1700 Daniel <coughs> Road in Villarica. He's asking to rezone parcel Z0700-10015 at 207 Westview Drive in Villarica. Um, he's asked, he's requesting rezoning of the property from DT Commercial to DT Commercial Mixed Use um, in order to use the houses on the parcel as residences and then to convert them to businesses later. 
Um, the proposed use would not necessarily have a negative impact on the usability of adjacent and nearby properties. Planning staff recommended denial of this request. Planning Commission recommended approval of this request. Um, the DTCMU does um, match what was in the future land use in the comprehensive plan, but it does not um, coincide with the recent RSVP downtown master plan, which designated the, this property as commercial. And the applicant is present. Okay, at this time, we'd like to hear from the applicant. I see him in the audience, so sir, if you'd like to come forward and say any, make, make any comments, or council may have some questions for you. Could you, could you come yeah. up here, please? This what, Elisa? This was, was D two. Where is it now? Because I read all through this. Now I can't find it because the updated yeah. agenda. D two. Yeah. Mr. Melendez, would you like to make any comments? It's E two. Well, I really don't have any comments uh, right now. You know, uh, try to use uh, these uh, properties. You know, for uh, residential right now and uh, later on in the future. You know, uh, try to. See if you everything doing better on uh, commercial, you know, moving uh, to uh, for commercial. But uh, right now, my plans are, uh, you know, that's uh, to fix on um, those houses uh, and uh, get somebody to move in. Uh, in. So that's my uh, main concerns right now. Are there any questions for the applicant? Thank you, sir. No, I, I do oh. have a question. Do you intend to use these as rental property, residential rental property? Each of these houses, yes, three sir. separate houses are they duplexes I, I'm trying to get a clarification one of the big houses on this like a duplex uh, one's a duplex you know there's like a uh, four apartments small apartments you know like a one uh, bedroom one bath and uh, the other house uh, that's a duplex also you know there's a uh, two two apartments and uh, that one uh, if I'm right that's a uh, three Three or one, or I can't remember exactly the address. Uh, and uh, two or seven, you know, there's a uh, one single uh, property. Okay, but all of it for residential. Exactly. Okay. Any question? Any more questions for applicant? Well, let me just <laughs> go a little further. Did you just buy this property? When did you buy this property? A couple of weeks ago. Yes. Yeah. Did you know at that time it was zoned commercial? No. Nope. You didn't know the zoning was commercial nope. there? That's the reason I buy it, you know, <laughs> for a okay. residential. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I have a staff question that I want to hear from our planning and zoning board members, but it was my understanding that Mr. Melendez did know that it was zoned commercial. At the time that I met with him, he had not closed on the property, and he told me that he had not purchased it at that, you know, had not completed the purchase. Um, and I did tell him at that time that it was zone commercial. So it's your understanding that prior to the purchase of it, he knew that it was zone com commercial? Correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of staff? So, you, the, the request, the application is to go from commercial to well, downtown commercial to downtown commercial mixed use, correct? Mm -hmm. But commercial mixed use, tell us what that generally is meant. Generally, it means that you can use um, the parcel for business or residential use. The parcel? So my understanding is that that mixed use is actually intended to be a single unit, a single building, with, with the mixed use in there, retail on the base, and then above it, housing, or that it would be the same development when a development's put together. Is that correct? Correct. It can be either one. And also for downtown CMU, you can't have single family residential, correct? That's correct. So even if we grant the application, it still can't be used for the purpose that he stated just a few minutes ago. That is correct correct technically um the reason and let me back up a little bit when mr melendez came to me and asked to do the rezoning um he did indicate that he would be amenable to using this as commercial later once he had used it as a resident as residence residences for a while um in looking at all the available rezonings 
possible in Leesdown Town. That, you, that zoning met his need the most closely. Um, the density that he's planning to use in that, on that parcel comes to 7.1 density units per acre. That's really close to what um, a condo or a, a loft apartment might be as well. Um, I know it's ideally not exactly the definition of a condo or a loft, but it's, it's close in the density. Um, it did not meet um, the intensity um, and the scale of the central business district. Um, I knew if, if he asked for um, single family residential or even multifamily residential, he would not be able to use those as a business later. And again, the future land use had designated as commercial mixed use. They can't do a second story on those buildings anyway because they can't be altered, correct? Right, that's correct. Let me understand that a little better. Uh, there was some indication, and I don't think it was in the packet, but that, that is historical property. It is historic property. And explain to us what that... And that did come up at the Planning Commission meeting, that if um, he desires to make any changes to the outsides of the buildings, that would have to go before Historic Preservation Commission for approval. Did I understand him say he's going to put four, four families in one house? No, there's two families, two units in one house, two units in another house, and one unit in the oh, last house. So, that's so total of five, five housing house. units. Because I'm, I'm like Councilman Marshman, I thought I heard the same thing. And I may have misunderstood. Well, I've, re I've read all through this. I've talked to people on both sides, numerous people. Um, three of the four planning and zoning people reached out to me. They also heard this. And um, it sounds like it complies with the current land use but with our updated renaissance plan it doesn't comply with what we ultimately want to see there on the downtown renaissance i worked on the downtown renaissance number of the planning and zoning people the people out in the community um ultimately that's what we want to see commercial over there but if you also believe in free market principles, there's a time where government tries to force something to happen if the market's not there for it. And right now, nobody's beating down our doors to, f to do anything with those houses. They are, I'd call them blighted. They've sat there, they're deteriorating. We could wait and hope that somebody comes and does what we prefer that they do and put commercial there. Um, but if Villarica is not that hot yet, the demand isn't there, they may sit there for a number of years. We've got somebody who's willing to fix them up, turn them into residential. They aren't on the main street. And if the demand comes in a couple of years and the economy stays good, it'll be more valuable as commercial and that's when the free market works. Somebody comes in and says, I want that property because that's valuable for commercial because of what's going on in Villa Rica and I'll pay you this for it. And that's how you get what you want, ultimately. But if we try to sit here and dictate it, I don't know, we may end up with them sitting over there looking like they do now for a long time. <coughs> let, me, let me just clarify something. I, it does not meet the current zoning. That's well, why it's coming before. Right, not the current zoning. I think what the the current future the land use right. map. But you don't even get to that if you deal with the zoning first, which is one of the primary definitions of being a city, is the zoning. I don't take a back seat to anyone when it comes to private property rights. But when you live in a city, or you live in an HOA, you have elected to give up some of those in favor of what the greater community has decided to do. This zoning, even if we change it to CMU, will not fit what he's wanting to do. So then they're going to come back and ask for another exception to even that. I, I don't see how we grant these these spot zoning requests just in the idea that maybe it'll do something better for it today or, or in the short term. Well, I'll mention that it was a unanimous decision with our planning and zoning board who also heard it. And I'm not sure the part about coming back again, because you said Technically, it didn't, but it looked like, based on the email I'm getting, I mean, it does get a little confusing and technical, but on all the emails I've gotten and the latest we got from you, it sounded like that commercial mixed use 
and what's planned there will be okay. It yeah. will or it won't. If you look at the definition of a condo or a loft, which is what is allowed by commercial mixed use, it would not technically be allowed. Okay, so what does um, that mean? But it if will you look not. At the density, I was looking at the density units per acre, which comes to over seven units per acre. That's real close to what a multifamily housing or a, um, not necessarily a condo or loft, but some sort of multifamily housing would be at that density level. So it possibly, so it could, it could maybe not be okay technically, but then it could be okay. It could be okay. But, <laughs> so don't just um, get it. <laughs> but clear, going back. This kind of stuff that we're doing now, I mean, what we I think that's yeah, exactly right, Ms. Marchman. And we got in trouble with this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you got the law there to do it, why are you going to technically go over yonder? Or why are you going to do something else when you got it there? I mean, and then you're going to say that he knew what he buying when he bought it. I don't see how we can, mm -hmm. how we can skip around. And ultimately, that's, that's why staff had recommended denial of this. You know, we had staff recommend denial, and we had plan and zoning recommend approval. So we, we if we don't have any more questions for staff, I would love for the, uh, uh, Mr. Mount ran that meeting, I, know, I believe. So I'd love to hear from you, sir. I think we, do we have two planning and zoning? How many? We have uh, at least two, yeah. yeah. I, know. I don't think uh, John Hannibach's here tonight. No, yeah, I said we have two. John's got a um, so during the planning zoning meeting, I mean, we asked some of these questions, and I didn't. I have a little folder with all the uh, regs in it, but I didn't have it with me. So when I looked at it at home, it did seem to, like um, Mr. McDougal said, it did seem not quite to match um, the density. I agree with Janet on. My main thought was. This is probably what it will be zoned once we finish the comprehensive plan and the city planning. I, I know the RSVP has some uh, different plans, you know, for this downtown area. And I think, again, what Leslie said, we thought would be best to have the property used up until that time. So it does get, it is very confusing. After I looked at it more after the meeting, um, you know, it, it was, um, wasn't clear on what that use, you know, can he legally use it? If someone come in and complain this is not the use for this property, I think he may, you know, wouldn't be allowed to do it. So it was, yeah, this it wasn't a real clear issue. So. But I'll answer any questions if you have some. Thank you, sir. Mr. Corsh. Larry, Cor <coughs> Larry Cors, the planning zoning. The, one of the key issues that comes up repeatedly is about best use. If you'll help me a little bit. In court, the, <coughs> the applicant who is denied will then go to court and ask for injunctive relief for the purpose of having his desires carried out. And the court will then look at it and say, is this a best use? Or is he trying to do something really screwy and stupid? And my old analogy, I try to say is, is the applicant coming forward to put in a nuclear waste dump in downtown? Of course, I would say, no, no that's not best use. But if you're talking about <coughs> something where it is just slightly off, where we have a conflict in what we have taken onto the law as the uh, as a zoning statute as and then the renaissance plan and they we haven't worked out the conflict and then you're asking someone else to make the decision so when the applicant comes forward he's trying to put his best foot forward make an investment and 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 use it as the best use that it is intended for the next question comes up to you would be okay if he's not here renaissance schmenaissance he's sitting down with people in his property or the prior owner is actually sitting with residences occupied by renters, do we have a renaissance or not? I say no, because you actually have people who are complying with existing grandfathered statute. And what would be the difference? There's no difference between the two. 
and that was our basic that was our basic decision going along in uh, in our in our discussion the other night last week was that <coughs> that it was basically there wasn't that much difference and we were actually infringing upon the applicant's rights thank you sir okay we will have public comments at this time anyone wishing to speak for or against this rezoning please come forward and do so uh, sign in for the record and please limit your comments to three minutes not everybody at once y'all listen Hello, my name is Mia Feliciano. I'm a, a veteran business owner. I just recently moved in October. I'm for the granting him the, because she said it's technically it's this and based on the way the, the, doc, the policy is written. The government has always wrote amendments and wrote technically amendment based on this, technically it's that. And because it will f eventually look like it's falling apart and make the whole face of that area look horrible. If you're bringing in more money, your revenue, um, bringing in people, you're talking about people who are looking for jobs, you're, you're changing the whole face of that area. That area is really an eyesore, it looks, the way it looks <coughs> now. And then based on for the next couple of months, it's not going to get any better. The weather is going to keep deteriorating. The property things is just going to keep, just look horrible, bigger eyesore than it is now. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else? Seeing none, we'll revert back to the council. Discussion? I, I'm a little confused on uh, we on it. I heard that it still couldn't do what it wanted to do with it. I didn't really understand that one. What's the purpose of rezoning if you can't do what he wants to do with it? Um, he could ask for a variance for um, single family residential. However, based on what he's doing, it's not actually single family residential because he's going to have more than one housing unit. So that's where the problem comes in our definition. Let me ask you a question, Avery. Really had someone speak about what would happen in court but the truth is what would happen in court is whether we've applied our own policies equally and consistently is that correct sure and <clears throat> he would have to prove that it would be unconstitutional as it's currently zoned as well so before you could get to that that the, the previous question so the fact is it's our responsibility to apply our own zoning equally and consistently that's what we should do as a council Yes. Yeah. Just a, an observation I'd like to make is uh, I heard uh, Mr. Mount make a comment that um, don't want to some of the effect of you we didn't have all the information or you really felt like you might have um, perhaps looked at it differently. That's not your words. That's my words. But. With that said, I want the council to understand that, that you have three options here, as I see it, well, four, but three, you can approve it tonight or you can send it back to planning and zoning for further review. So just, you know, just throwing that out for consideration. But the, the point that I want to, to Councilman Marshman's point, uh, two things, it does not meet zoning now, correct? Correct. That's why you're here. That's why we're here. Uh, and to Councilman Marshman's point, uh, those zonings are in place, and, and I also am, am very f aware that, uh, the, that governments don't need to step on private citizens' toes, and, and I'm, but at the same time, uh, I would prefer a, a high-rise building not be built next to my house, so there's a reason for zonings to be in place. So I just would, uh, that's just my comments. Let's mention that those are residential places right now. That's what's been operating there all these years. We are wanting it, we have now zoned it commercial, but they're residential properties that are sitting there. We want to force it to be commercial, but we don't have one buyer standing in line waiting to buy and fix those places up. I haven't heard of one wanting to fix it up. So what are we going to do? We're allowed to rezone things, commercial mixed use, right? It could be commercial or it could be residential with commercial mixed use, correct? 
Is some of the complication this have to do with the fact of old communities and just the change that comes from being in old town and things being grandfathered in, just like old pipes in the ground, is trying to catch up? You know what I'm saying? Well, I think some of the complication comes from the definition of commercial mixed use and what type of residential is allowed there. And he can't, he can't build up, so can't meet it that way because we're not allowed to alter those buildings because of mm -hmm. historic preservation. So they can't be altered and go up and have a two-story with a business downtown and house upstairs. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Other discussion? Yeah, I, I've got a question. In one of the emails it mentioned that the houses cannot be torn down ever? They could be torn down with historic preservation approval. And right. the downtown renaissance discouraged any more teardowns right. as part and of the plan. If, if you were to rezone and if you were to grant a variance for residential, what's the parking requirement? For residential? Um, for, seven, for six or five units or whatever. For five units, it would be about 12 spaces. Is that on the site also? He does have parking. Um, there's a little piece of the parcel, I don't know if you have a picture of it, over to the left that he's planning on using as, as additional parking. Um, Does it get the 12 spaces? I think he can get the 12 spaces there. Is there a plan that shows that? Not yet. Well, that would come back with a variance request. Mm -hmm. so, so my concern is twofold. One, the no teardown boxes us in I'm thinking of downtown East Point where I worked, where the MARTA station came in in about 1986, and 120 downtown businesses were displaced that never came back. And for 31 years, their downtown has sat with a almost vacant city block, the biggest block downtown. So I know that if we're not careful, we could have these houses sit vacant for decades. So I'm not telling you to rezone or not rezone or whatever, but practically, and I think the councilwoman is getting to this, is what's the future of these, this parcel, practically? Cause a, so, because why would a business want to go in there? They don't, but if it gets fixed up and improved, it'll be a lot more attractive when Villa Rica does get hot. And I'm not saying, I, we're getting there, but at this point, the demand is not there for all those buildings. Right, but I, I would argue that the demand at the level of rent that would be required to justify actually fixing them up is not there either. I had that conversation. Fixing them up is no small task and lots yeah. of money. And and for COs to be issued where you have multiple residents in a house is not insignificant. I had that conversation with the applicant because that's my concern. We don't want it to look, we want it to be fixed up. We want it to look attractive. I, d I just, I don't, I don't that, see how there's a future for those three properties being nice residential or nice commercial I just I, I don't I don't I can't see how to get from today to that you don't see them looking nice commercial either just because of the lots too small the parkings inadequate right I mean is, is that just me or there's a picture in the RSVP plan that shows them. Yeah, the I that saw person. that. I see it, but I don't see the parking. Yeah. Well, see part of that yeah. is we are trying to encourage to be a more walkable where you don't always park right in front of where you want to go. You know, I mean, you don't do that in Atlanta all the time either. In other communities, sometimes you have to park behind and you walk, you walk from the parking lot across the street. 
on the overview that we have on, on the screen now, <clears throat> uh, can you tell me where the three houses are located? Yeah. Um, <coughs> I'll just kind of point up here. No. There are two on the large, well, there are all three on the large piece, but there's one at the top corner. There's um, one at the. Go over here, uh, Janet, please. Okay. Why don't you put this other view up? It's got the houses on it. We'll get our high tech equipment. We'll be able to see. Go ahead, Janet. Can you put that? Put the one up that has the houses on it, Lisa. Okay. 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 Thank you. This shows the houses, right? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. boys and girls, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I do have a little bit of a concern about the the, the discrepancy in the numbers too. If, if we're talking about three houses with two families in each, and, and we have to have tw twelve parking spaces, uh, is that part of of this? Uh, is the applicant willing to do that? Is he going to build a parking space, or are they just going to, you know, the people that rent, are they just going to park in the, the yard, or, I mean, what? We, the street. We talked about parking in that little piece that comes off at the bottom. Um, he is looking at making that additional parking. But is there anything in place for this for this body to, to hold him accountable to that? I mean, I... Not at this time. He would have to come back. You're not being asked to do that tonight, right. though. I, I realize that. I know that's not what we're looking at, but I mean. He can't move forward even if we rezone it with what he's he'd have to going to do. He'd have to come back. I think we should take the option of sending it back to planning and zoning off the table because it was a unanimous decision, and last I s communicated with any of them in the last 24 hours, all of them felt the same way. Okay. Would you make that informal motion so we can move forward then? No, she said she wanted to take that off the table. Yeah, yeah, off the table. yeah I, I want to make You motion. had said okay. we have these options. I'll make a motion that we deny this rezoning request. I have a motion to deny the rezoning request. Do I have a second? Second. Motion to second. Discussion? If not, call the question. All in favor of the rezoning? I mean, I mean I'm mean, i sorry. My bad. Deny. Deny the rezoning as requested. All in favor of that? One, two, three. All opposed? Did you vote for? Okay, so we have 4 1. The motion to rezone is denied. Okay. Item 3, lease of old Head Start property. Um, Ms. Angelette Guyton came to visit City Hall and asked to lease the old Head Start building. This building is owned by an organization called CAFE out of LaGrange, Georgia. The property the building sits on belongs to the city of Eureka. Um, Mr. Mecklin had asked if Mrs. Guyton could come to the city council meeting and do a presentation to the council so that you all would be more aware of what she wants to do with the property. And Mrs. Guyton is present. Okay. Would you have a please? Good evening. Hi. Thank you very much for inviting me here this evening. Um, Villarica is a very beautiful city. It's interesting to see all the information that was displayed this evening. Um, it was great. Thank you very much. Um, so I am Angelette Guyton. Um, I would like to open up um, the building at 311 Claire Corn. It was previously uh, Head Start by Kathy. We would like to bring it back as a digital preschool. Um, it will not be a Head Start school. Um, it will be privately owned. We will accept some um, subsidies, um, but it will be private tuition. Um, we're very excited about that. We um, are already um, stationed as a LLC based out of Northern California. Um, we have four active board, mem board, board members right now. Excuse me, a little nervous. Um, we have a director, which is myself. I have an early childhood development background as well as financial accounting background. 
Um, I have a secretary who ha also has education background and administration background, and we have a licensed social worker who works out of DeKalb County. And um, I have a treasurer on my team as well um, who will be stationed in Northern California, the East Bay, um, and she'll be doing our IT work as well. So we'll be connecting from the East Bay and um, from California and for Georgia. I have just moved up here to Georgia, so I'm very excited about being a part of the community um, and reestablishing the school in that neighborhood. With the city council's permission this evening. <laughs> and before you leave, we'll state your name. Just put it on the list and a way that we can get in touch with you if you haven't already done it's so. It's here already. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, and you answered one of my questions because I kept seeing all the addresses, everything being California, California. I'm like, well, who's going to be here running it? So yes. you are here now. Yes, okay. I am in the Mirror Lake District. Okay. Ms. Guyton, thank, thank you for being here. Is your company a for-profit company? Yes, it's for-profit. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Basically, you'd be running a private preschool. Yes, that's correct. But you could have some subsidies for people that qualify through what, that lottery fund for preschoolers? That okay. is correct. Okay. One of the questions I had or, or brought up Thursday was a building that it stays in here is in a, a lot of disrepair right now. And it says that uh, trees have been removed and Kathy is working with the insurance company to have the building repaired. But you do realize that building is in disrepair, so. Yeah, actually we uh, went by the building and we were the ones who s to see that that, build, that the tree had fell on the building. So we notified Kathy and came down to the city and notified the city that the tree had fell in the parking lot and on the building. So we've been very proactive to work with Kathy when anything go on, just to establish a strong relationship with the city of Villarica and with Kathy since they are kind of a distance away from Villarica. So, so just for public edification, the Kathy owns the building, yes. we own the land. That's correct. That's the complicated part. My notes say to defer to city attorney, and I figured that <laughs> had to I'm not going to know what that means, too. The acting city. Well, I figured it had to do with the complication between it's our property, but the building isn't ours. That's part of the complication. Uh, the <coughs> other complication is that it also could be a, well, the first complication is we don't know, I don't believe we found the current agreement that uh, specifies our relationship with Kathy as to the building and the property concerning the lease terms or maintenance or anything concerning the property. So finding that will be step one. <clears throat> step two is that although the city can enter into a lease with a nonprofit such as Kathy to uh, provide ser the same services that the that that city government could provide as well, then the city can do that, and they can give they can lease that to Kathy for no rent. But to allow Kathy to then turn around and lease it to a for-profit entity, the city, I don't believe, could do. So you said we're we need to find something else as to our agreement with Kathy that we don't have our hands on right now. And I believe we mentioned that at the work session that the staff was going to look for that, and so that is one piece of the puzzle. But that, in the attic. But that doesn't solve the issue of Kathy then leasing it to a for-profit entity as well. That would still be a problem. You saying they can't do it, or they have to go through some hoops to get done? I don't think you, the city, can do it. But she, she can work through cafe. Can she work through because uh, my understanding is that the <clears throat> only letter of intent basically is that the for-profit is going to pay Kathy money for property that the city government uh, gives to Kathy or allowed Kathy to use free of charge because they provided a service that the city government provided. And so we can't then allow Kathy to use that property to lease to a for-profit entity and get money for that while they're not providing a city substitute city services. So we can't or we can't do it for free? Well, we, we can't do it for free. Um, I Because, okay, before we probably had an agreement, what, a dollar a year and Head Start ran a program yes. in there that was for the benefit of the community. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's over with. Now we have <coughs> a building that's owned by CAFI with a for-profit, 
preschool wanting to then lease that building from them mm -hmm. can we lease them the property I, I haven't looked into that <laughs> <laughs> the, the way it's currently set up I don't believe the city can do can do that could we, yeah, we, could we, we not we couldn't do this at all the way the way it's currently proposed the city cannot do it the way it's proposed we can't okay I'm gonna take your advice for it because I don't understand the legal ramifications Tom's got a question yeah so my question was could Kathy lease the building to us and we sublease it to the daycare And again, I think we need to know what Kathy's, how Kathy's ownership in this, like, what's their lease term for the ground lease? I mean, do we have at least two of them for... Why, why can't we do a new one? We, we could do a new one with them, yes. Because um, I'm understanding from Elisa that she's looked and she can't find the document. And we could potentially enter into a new ground lease with Kathy. And if that ground lease... It perhaps could be structured a way where it would work. It, the current structure, I don't believe, would work. So. Right. So, the, so the, they would lease the ground from us. We would lease the building from them, and then sublease to the daycare. I hope somebody got that. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds to me like this is something we should we table this. I mean, this doesn't sound like we can take any action on right. based on what we. If we want to look at it, where it's basically. Uh, we're not we're no longer allowing Kathy to use it for free or for a dollar or something like that and we're just looking into leasing our mm -hmm. property mm -hmm. and getting money for that then mm -hmm. yes I'd say let's table it let's look into whether we can take that step I think that's, good idea. that's the only thing that seems to make sense mm -hmm. all right I make a motion we table this how long a month mm -hmm. one meeting to the October meeting? To the October meeting? Yeah, both would be fine. Yeah. Okay. Get this figured out. Is that okay with you, Ms. Guyton? I mean, that's about the only option we're going to have tonight. Yeah. I'll make a motion that we table this to the October Thank meeting. Thank you for coming. Second. I have a motion in multiple seconds that we table this to the October meeting. Further discussion? If not, all in favor? Is unanimous. Thank you. Ma'am, we would invite you to come back to the October meeting. Mm -hmm. And we're not, this is nothing against you. We just have to make sure we're doing it the right way and legal. No problem. I can understand. We apologize for making you come back. Thank you. Why do you apologize? I wouldn't apologize. Would you want to sit through this no, meeting? We don't twice? know until we get Here she does. <laughs> okay, moving along. We have, uh, I've, I've still got item four. I was asked to remove item E5 and 6, but is item four not a part of that? Item 4 is a separate issue, and um, this is the issue that we brought to the work session. Um, it was a, a development agreement with D.R. Horton for the Falls subdivision, and we are going to ask if you could table this one as well. Okay. Um, okay. There were some issues that we did not get worked out in time for this meeting. No, we left it on the agenda, so I don't know to table it to the, uh, what meeting, October? Four, five, and six. We should won't be here, but we took, we struck five and six off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we are, do I hear, I've got a motion. Make a motion we that remove. we table item number four, development agreement with D.R. Hort Holmes. All in favor? I already said it, once. it is unanimous. It will come back to us at the October meeting. Items five, E5 five and 6 will so uh, remove from the agenda. Uh, item F1, this is, it says Connors Road Park Master Plan, but this is for, yeah, it is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Continue. Connors Road Master Plan we discussed in work session. I, I believe that the the developing consensus was that we modify uh, the acceptance of the proposal to include only the boundary survey and the geotechnical work, and that if that those results are positive and satisfactory, then we look at moving ahead <coughs> based on our on our schedule and the mayor's request 
in the work session was that we consider rebidding the work at that time, but that's for in the future. Right now, what we're proposing is to accept the proposal to do the boundary survey and the geotechnical for twenty thousand dollars. Just to kind. Of just to kind of elaborate on it, I, I was shocked to find out that we accepted this property, um, even though it was free, quote unquote, uh, and we, there's no boundary survey. There's no survey on this property. So that, that's part of this. And, and um, so that's why I think we need to move forward. But I do think we need to consider uh, bidding out the engineering portion of it. When we get to that point. Yeah. When we get to that point. So. I want to make a motion that we uh, authorize the boundary survey and the geotechnical survey. Uh, $20,000. $20,000 and reserve the, the, the next step till after we get that. Second. Got a motion to second. Discussion? Yes, sir. I'm looking at the detail and I'm seeing 20500 mm. on the next page. Oh, wait a second. I got 13 and a half versus 13. I got 13, 5, and 7 instead of 13 and 7. So can we do 20,500? No, we can't do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Councilman, would you amend your motion? I will amend my Not to exceed 21,000. Hmm. Or do you want to make it a... 20,500. <laughs> okay. Not one more. No. Okay. Would you amend your motion? It is Your second, I mean? Yes. Okay. The motion is to approve uh, spending $20,500 for the boundary survey and the geotechnical survey. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Unanimous. And on cue, the man comes to the front. Front cover of the magazine here not too long ago, GQ, coming right on up. <laughs> I didn't know that that was going to be on the cover. That's a surprise. Nice. But I haven't had any agents calling me for me to quit my day job, so it looks like I'm safe. That's, did you say it looks like you're stuck? No, safe. 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 Not stuck. Safe. 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 We played that at least. We're, so glad they're not, we're glad they're not calling. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I was not here last week. I figured since I had been here for two years, I could take two days off for vacation. So uh, I'm you sorry I wrong. missed the meeting. Uh, <laughs> but, I, but I did uh, listen to the meeting so I could be up to date on what's going on. And uh, Mr. Barber did an excellent job representing me. And so I, I thank him for that. I uh, did want to say just very quickly um, that this is a uh, proposal for a very integral part of a larger um, economic development potential for downtown. Uh, I know Mr. Barber mentioned about the TAD allocation district and uh, tax allocation district and there were some questions about that. Uh, we feel this is an important component of being able to move the TAD forward. Uh, there were some concerns that I understand about the bond and, and I would, what I would tell the council is to think about the tax allocation district like splashed money, if you will. Um, you, why you can float a bond, you don't necessarily have to float a bond. So I don't want us to think just because we do the TAD, then we got to get a bond. Um, the bond can be directly related to the project. So once a developer is identified and the developer says, hey, we want to do this project, then we can get the bond contingent upon the developer moving forward with the project, if that makes sense to everyone. So I don't want us to get bogged down on you know, this project and the TAD and the bond, because they're not all connected. They can be, but they don't have to be. So I just want to make sure we're, we're clear with that. Um, what, I, what I tell people is what we're building is an economic development toolbox. So having the ability to do a TAD will entice a developer because then the developer knows that we can then take that TAD to help offset some of the infrastructure costs for the project. So us laying the foundation and the framework for being able to do the TAD helps us better to go out and recruit the, de the developers to do the projects. Uh, and so I, I just want us to, to know that um, there's things that we're going to be doing, like the TAD, uh, we, the um, Rural Opportunity Zone guidelines and application got released last Wednesday. Um, so we'll be looking at that as well. That's another economic development tool with tax credits. So 
these things help us be able to fund the projects without using general fund money. And that's really, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do. Um, this makes you, you all's job easier uh, for us to be able to do this. Um, as the mayor mentioned when we had our uh, planning meeting, that it's a, uh, incumbent upon me to find the money to do these <laughs> projects. That's exactly what we're doing. We're trying to bring ideas and concepts to the council that makes your job easier uh, because we realize that infrastructure uh, is going to be very important moving forward for the growth. Um, this project with Tom Walsh uh, is one key component of that. If we don't know how to plan the area, we won't know how to adequately, uh, uh, adequately uh, price the TAD, if you will. And so this will help us get an idea of what the value of the property could be moving forward and how much we can anticipate uh, coming back with the TAD. So we have to do the planning part to be able to move forward with the initiation part. Uh, and so that's why we're bringing this proposal. We felt like uh, this was the synergy with what was already done with the Scherner property, moving that all the way down. Uh, that what I'm calling now the downtown connector corridor uh, and moving it to 78 uh, and we think that this will be very beneficial to the city as I always tell you all it's about the highest and best use for our land uh, and we always talk about not being like other cities that relates to their non ability to plan so I think this is really uh, beneficial for us to move forward with this project yes ma'am would you explain briefly what a TAD is? Since absolutely. I know what it is, but three years ago I would have been sitting out there going a what? Yes, absolutely. Well, the first thing that it is not is a tax increase. If anybody ever asks you, that's not what it is. Uh, <coughs> TAD is, is taking the incremental increase in funding uh, from a piece of land. So just to give you an example. So we have a piece of land that's $5. That's the rate of tax that we're collecting on it, $5. The county gets a percentage of that, the school board gets a percentage of that, the city gets a percentage of that. What a TAD does is a TAD takes what that base rate of $5 and it says, okay, you all the taxing entities are going to get their percentage of that $5. Then what we do is we go out and we work and we get developers and we get somebody to build a house on that. So now the property tax uh, is $10. So the county and the school board and the school system still get their, per their percentage of the $5 but the extra $5 goes into this fund to pay for infrastructure and things inside that tax district. So we haven't raised the tax rate. We've just, through our work and due diligence, we've increased the value of that property by having either something built on it or having improvements done in that area. So that money goes back to pay for, and that's how you get your money uh, to pay for the bond. So we could just collect every annually the tax rate and just keep it in a fund and do it or if we have a developer who wants to front end the project then we get a bond and then we pay the bond back with that fund of the increased fund collected on the tax revenue to pay the bond the beautiful thing is that doesn't impact the, the general fund the city's not writing a check to pay for that bond the TAD is paying for the bond on the city's behalf and so I know Ideally, you don't want to do the bond unless you know you can service it. And so that's why we need to do this project, because this helps us be able to determine what we need to do to be able to service the debt on the bond. So then I have a question. It said, if we approve this, it's for $11,660. Mm -hmm. Okay, and over on page, like, two, where it says fees and terms, like what they're going to do, site visit, zoning analysis. Then they have something that says to be determined. That just threw me off. Can this number change uh, that we're being asked for? Can that number morph into something higher? A, a lot of that is contingent upon us wanting them to do more. So the, obviously the more work we ask them to do outside of the scope of what they're proposing, then obviously that price is going to change some. Okay, optional perspective renderings to be determined would be if we ask them to do more than yeah. what we have yeah. right here. But you'll come back to us for that tonight. Yeah, absolutely. We're, yeah, we're going yeah, to go, go and do more without having a prior approval. So, so Chris, you, you explained that very well. Basically, what this is is a way to pay for the road, Correct. the connector, without dipping into the general fund, tax money, SPLOS money, or a GO bond. Uh, the folks that will be paying for this road are the folks that will eventually live in that tax allocation district, TAD. 
or, and the or, business. or have businesses yeah. or yeah, businesses right. and, and yeah but and, and the reality is you don't really know if you live in the tat or not because you're not going to be charged a different right tax you're not going to tell anybody else but the tax for this rate is going to be the same it's just when it when we receive it how it's divvy when we get the money but and the other component of this is that it has to be approved by the state legislature Correct. It has to be approved by the Carroll County Board of uh, Commissioners since this, this parcel is in Carroll County and by the Carroll County Board of Education. Yes, ideally all three taxing entities. Wait, I see a no. Agree. <laughs> We're in the process of... Don't have to be. No, that's... But... but. The, the, ta the redevelopment powers have to be approved by the legislature. The TAD doesn't have to be approved by anybody but y'all. The participation in the TAD, other than us, has to be approved by the county and the school board. Right. right. Yeah, just so communication. there's a, a state approval that's one time that gives us the power to do TADs as many times as we want to. Y'all decide to do the TAD. The property owners are not participants in that decision. The real nut is us negotiating with the county and the school board to get their participation. Right. Because what happens at the end of the day is we will be building a road and putting in infrastructure and paying for 25% of it. Right. And the county will be paying 25 and the school board will be paying 50 because that's about the way the millage works. Right. That's why this is better than us putting away money and then doing it one day because then we'd be paying 100% of it. Does that make sense? It does. In, in the, um, I lost my time out. All right, another thing that we need to talk about is BM and K. <coughs> so you guys approved a contract for them to engineer the road and I have asked them to stop waiting on tonight's decision because what I would like is for this firm and BM and K and Chris and I to work together so that we're master planning the development around the road as we develop the location of the road because the road is going to bisect parcels of land potentially and may or may not sit on existing roads and is going to cross roads and if we're not careful, we may put the road where it's the best top topographically, but the worst developmentally, or vice versa. If 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 Walsh is involved and he's driving it, mm -hmm. he may want the road where it's the best for him developmentally, but the worst for us from an engineering standpoint. You know what I'm saying? So there's some tension here. The, and Chris and I are going to need to facilitate that fight between the engineer and the designer because their their objectives are different. BM and K is trying to recommend the best road route, and from a construction standpoint, but Walsh is going to his mandate is going to be to maximize the digest value of the adjacent property. Right? You see how those are not yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are not mm -hmm. in the G-Hall necessarily. So I've asked BM and K to wait until we get this done, and then we're going to get together. Chris and I will work with them. And my other point that I forgot my, what I was going to say is the key element to this, the reason this is necessary is because we've got to sell what we're going to. We're not going to have a tag. We're going to sell the properties commercial or residential. So this is a planning portion of that, not completely separate from the road, but in, in conjunction with the road. You ready for a motion? To get Ready for a motion? No. Okay. Well, maybe you're at 12 o'clock. So here come some sitting? more questions. All right. Two questions. Number one, will these folks determine the property that the TAN will be involved with? Or is that going to be part of the other guys? That will probably be more Chris and myself coming out of this whole process, recommending to you a tad boundary which could be bigger than the than the connector correct you know it could, it could jump east it could go northwest it could even come down on to 
other parts of the city <laughs> that we're not going to talk about. Correct. Right? So, I mean, it could, it could get bigger than the connector is my right. point. Then the, the, the other question is uh, the fees and terms over here that and it asked for 11.6 on the front of our page, yet it's only 10.6 uh, on the, the uh, page 2 of the handout. Which one are we asking for? 11.6. Uh, There's a TBD on that other page. Page yeah, two. we put I put in a 10% uh, contingency just in case they so that we can make sure we're covered. But is, is your request is for 11 6, 11 6, correct? That's correct. That's where the 1060 came from, then, right? Because he could have some direct expenses, yeah, yeah that's exactly 10%. Yep, because we're going to drag him into one at least one meeting that he's not expecting, and maybe more than that, right. based on what we just said, <laughs> right. Was that both sometimes questions? we have meetings to plan other meetings so <laughs> <laughs> what is your design was that both questions councilman best do you have any more questions right. you have? okay i make a motion that we approve the downtown connector planning services for eleven thousand six hundred and sixty second with tsw will you amend your with tsw okay Second. Have a motion and a second. Discussion? Not all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. You always keep me guessing, Councilman. <laughs> we, we need to strike H, don't we? Good first one. It's a good first one. That'll come. Okay. Uh, Get it in piecemeal. I don't know why H is on there. We don't I'm not either. That was really for the work yeah, question. Yeah, that was just... Okay, that's okay. I, I don't need help being confused. It's okay. All right. Uh, do we have any executive session items? We have uh, discussion items. Do discussion items. Uh, well, that's what we just talked... That's what we just said. Those are just discussion items at the council... I mean, at the uh, work session, unless you want to bring... Well, well that's up to you. They were still on. They, so they were supposed to be taken off. They were supposed Typically to be they taken would off. be taken off. Well, can I just mention real quick then? Absolutely. Um, Old Town Village, because I know some of the people had to leave. Uh, Y'all all know the gist of it, because you were here in the work session. Um, the bank realized they didn't own anything over there anymore. They're not going to pay Georgia Power anymore. And they said Georgia Power went over and shut down all the street lights. Uh, a lot of the roads and things that weren't finished, this was not... I mean, there could have been a mess up on the city's part with not having a bond, but these communities exist all over Georgia and who knows where else when the housing boom collapsed and builders went defunct. And it wasn't our job to finish the roads. The builders were supposed to finish these things. And we learned the hard way sometime how to make sure we don't get stuck hang holding the bag, which we are in some of these cases now. And I, I would just like us, I would like us to get some lights on over there. We can get the consensus, get some lights on over there for them. I don't know how quick, what kind of decision do we have to make, Tom, for that to happen? Uh, a vote or what do we have to do? Okay. Right. I've got the contact at Georgia Power to speak with <coughs> if you decide to authorize me to do that. <coughs> I believe one of the residents. How many? How many lots are we talking about total? What I heard or wrote down, I think, was thirteen at fifteen a month. Okay. So that's at least a ballpark. Is that what you got? Uh, I wrote it down. It was pretty was. early. Okay, so it's a. Uh, you had three and a quarter. Thirteen a lights, <coughs> eleven houses, and three townhomes out there. But I heard earlier. Someone in public comments mentioned that this was a private community intended to be gated. <coughs> yeah, the case, it never the happened. It was never going to own those it streets. Originally, it was going to be gated. Mm -hmm. And we had a similar situation in 2014, right over here in town, where the city obviously wasn't going to take the road. It was down to near gravel, just like that is over there. And the answer was HOA, get your act together, <coughs> pave your own lights, and pave your own street. And that's exactly what happened. That one's pretty well built out, isn't it? This one is not. No, this one's less than 50%. I think the intention was, but it doesn't look like it's ever turning into a private. 
it, the city <coughs> on the road never existed it never got that far along but if the city is never going to own the road often we do intend to take the road but we won't in a private community where they're going to put up a gate so That's i think we need correct. more information on this so now that it's failed will we I think the city manager stated it correctly that there's it's ugly either way <laughs> this doesn't look pretty if we have to take it all on and try to take care of it but what do you do when you've got citizens living in the city paying city taxes and it with the light situation the road is a pain in the neck and there's big you know holes but it's not a safety issue you've got kids now they're walking in the dark whatever you know We've got a security safety issue out there. There's already been, there's some concern about break-ins and things that have gotten taken and people are trying to leave as many lights on as they can. Um, I think it's real minimal cost with the lighting. Is it $15 a month for the light, each light? That's uh, 195 a month, yeah. 13 lights. Okay. Any I think I heard the mayor say if we had to go over and unscrew some of them and turn on all the ones in front of people's houses, we'd do it. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, no, the next. I was going to have an adopt a light plan, but I think ultimately at that kind of price for citizens that live in the city that pay taxes, that's a small amount to, for us to pick up to keep those lights on. I know we can't do anything about the roads right now. Maybe we can patch them. We'll have to, maybe we can discuss that further down the road. Okay, this is something we need. Do you need? <coughs> we'll need some more. Mr. Barber, what would you prefer that we do at this point? What do you need from us? If it's the the consensus to turn the lights on, then then you need to just direct me to do it, and we'll get with Georgia Power. And Technically, this was not a council agenda item. We didn't amend the agenda. I, well, we can bring it up at the October meeting. I, I thought it. It was still on the agenda. Discussion um, Can we have a consensus without voting? Can you? <laughs> you can make a motion. You can't make the will of the council. This council, you, you can Lawyer? correct me if I'm wrong, but this was not on the printed agenda uh, okay. that was advertised. Correct. There would need to be a vote, so we can't turn on the lights till next month if we vote to do it because it was not on the advertised okay. agenda. Okay. It was on this piece of paper, but it was not on the agenda. I will remind council we do have a, a call meeting on the 22nd, is that correct? During the retreat. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. that. Okay. So you, I, I do agree with what you said, so you will follow up with that and make sure it's brought up. Okay. All right, do we have any executive session? items okay if not i would entertain a motion that we adjourn so moved okay. have a motion in multiple seconds all in favor we are adjourned i don't think you voted councilman carter but i, I did, did. He, said he was ready to go too yeah, yeah see his hands up wrong hand huh? <laughs>